Okay. Good afternoon. Just give this a couple more moments. Great. Um, I think we're going to get started. We have we have one panelist who is is running a little late, uh, but I'm sure they will be joining us very shortly. Um, but it's okay. We can start uh, our discussion on on time. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to um, our webinar focused on career and technical education, celebrating our nation's vital infrastructure to develop STEM talent. Um, and this is conjunction with Career and Technical Education, CTE Month. Um, uh, for those of you who are new to my organization, STEM Connector, uh, my name is Ted Wells. I am the president and a co-founder. Um, and we really aim to en enable our, our members in industry, uh, as well as stakeholders who work with industry, to engage in education impactfully and sustainably. Um, we do the following activities to support this work. We develop digestible insights to help understand systemic issues facing our ecosystem. We develop resources for um, internal and external stakeholder communication. Um, and we enable our community of stakeholders to build connections and share their work more broadly. Today's event, um, which is focused on CTE, um, is, an, is an area where we've actually had a lot of interest in our community over um, the, the course of our existence. Um, current technical education is nothing new. It's been around for over 100 years in um, various different forms. And, um, you know, really the, the basic aim of career and technical education is to help integrate into education um, aspects of what students are going to be needing to do when they enter the workforce. Uh, in a very intentional way. And that is true today more than ever. And it's actually um, something that I think employers are looking at now, uh, perhaps more. And so today's discussion um, is going to feature some very um, interesting uh, and, and dynamic folks. I think you're going to see sort of this, this high level um, from one of our panelists. Um, uh, uh, sort of middle level from another one and more on the ground level by design. Uh, and you'll, you'll pick up on that as I introduce them. But before I introduce our speakers, I want to give you a couple um, housekeeping notes for today's discussion. Uh, the chat box is open, so please pop on in. And if you haven't already, introduce yourself. When you do type in your uh, your name and, and organization and maybe where you are, um, just uh, make sure to check the box that says... Uh, everyone, not just panelists. Uh, that way, everybody will see it. Uh, use that chat box also as you think of questions that kind of pop into mind. We do have a Q&A box open. Um, doesn't really matter. We'll try to track both boxes. But um, we do want you to, to, to ask questions. And perhaps uh, they, we won't be answering questions, however, from the audience until probably the last 15 minutes or so um, of the webinar, uh, which will last until 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, we always get this question. Uh, this will be recorded. So um, if you miss something, there won't be slides today. Um, it's more just an open discussion, but um, the insights will be recorded. And I, I have a feeling that our members who are participating today are going to be sharing some links and we'll make sure um, that we'll have some links to share with the, in, their, in their remarks that we can, we can share out to in a follow-up email that we should be getting out um, by the end of, of the week. Um, Another piece to remember, this is, or just to bear in mind, is um, I, we have tons of, of really great content among um, the STEM Connector community. We are going to, on this on this topic, we're going to be looking at different aspects of um, sort of skilled trades, technician training, CTE being a big driver of, of workforce development and education in that space. Um, but we are, this is going to be an ongoing discussion, um, interested in uh, talking to folks who would like to discuss this more. But um, please, this is an area that we'll, we are actually looking to host. A, we will be hosting a workshop in the fall um, and developing an insight. Um, this is an area of, of where a work, 
employers have continually said that they are they're having significant challenges due to retirement and just inadequate people numbers of folks entering in to the workforce. So um, stay tuned. Um, finally, uh, just want to make a plug for our webinar next Friday at um, I believe it's at noon Eastern for International Women's Day. Um, check out, uh, you can find details on stemconnector.com under events. Um, Sheila Boynton, who's been a um, longtime colleague and, and partner of ours at STEM Connector will be moderating a discussion with representatives from Intel, um, Infosys, and BP. So make sure to sign up for that. Okay, so with all those things in mind, I'm pleased to introduce our panel, ists, um, just very briefly. Um, Kate Kramer is um, Executive Director of Advanced CTE um, and long time, known, known Kate for a long time, um, doing a lot of great work. She'll tell you a little bit about, more about what Advanced CTE does. Um, Doug Henderson is the Director of STEAM CTE at Valverde Unified School District in California. Doug has been a long time member of STEM Connector um, and does great work out in, um, in the, the Riverside County area, right? Uh, and Brian Bound, who's the Chief Growth Officer uh, at Inter International Society for Technology and Education, known as ISTE, as well as ASCD, which two organizations that merged. And I'm sure Brian can tell you um, about some of the work that he's doing. So, all right, everybody ready? <laughs> uh, I am going to pop into some some questions. So, first question, Kate. Um, for you, um, Advanced CTE is positioned to have sort of a bird's eye view of what's happening across the country. Can you tell our audience a bit about what your role, the organization's role is in the CTE ecosystem? And what are you seeing sort of at a macro level of some of the issues confronting this space? Well, hello, everybody, um, and thank you for the invitation and opportunity, Ted. Um, so I, yes, I'm Kate Kramer, Advanced CT. For those of you, since I actually, this is rare and special that I'm on a webinar where I'm looking at the names and I'm seeing, and I don't know many of you, so that is really exciting to get um, to engage kind of some new folks in this space. Um, Advanced CT is the national membership organization that represents state directors of curriculum education across all 50 states, DC, and the US territories. So our members are largely state level leaders within state education agencies, community tech college systems, board of regions, workforce development agencies, that oversee career tech across across the country. And CT looks very different in every state and every community. And so the ecosystem is very diverse, which is often we say one of our greatest strengths, one of our greatest challenges also, that it can be hard to do kind of the apples to apples. So our role as the membership organization, um, uh, we've been around for a hundred and four years. Um, as you said, CT was kind of the first federal investment was in 1917, and we were founded three years later to really create a space um, and a community for those individuals who oversee what are now Perkins plans, but as uh, CT has evolved, is much bigger than just that federal investment. So what we do is provide professional development, professional learning for these individuals. Um, we also you know, lean in pretty heavily in the state policy space around elevating what's happening, what are, you know, I'll talk about in a moment, we do an annual um, year in review where we just actually look at what's the universe of policies that states have passed um, around CT, impacting CTE, which over the past 10 years, there's been a lot, or 11 years, there's been a lot of them, um, as well as doing more direct technical assistance, particularly in spaces around kind of data quality, um, program quality, really attending to equity and inclusion um, within CTE systems, and then do a lot of the federal level um, as well. We are kind of their advocate uh, for Perkins, but also for as those paying attention now, there's movement around WIOA, the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. There's some movement around short-term Pell about uh, kind of creating more flexibility for individuals in kind of shorter programs uh, that are kind of quality programs to be able to access some of those resources and, and the like. And there's been a lot of federal activity. So that's a big part of why we were actually founded um, as well, was to kind of be not only a connector across these state leaders, but also to be their representative in the DC area. Um, in terms of what we're seeing, we'll, we'll get into that. I said we just uh, last week put out our kind of annual year in review um, and saw kind of, you know, over 47 states passed policies in 2020. Three, and that's pretty on trend um, each year. I will say for this group of interest, um, we kind of tag what those policies are. 
um, industry and partnerships was the top kind of policy area this year as well as last year. And that includes things like work-based learning um, around incentives or other ways to really engage industry um, when states have you know changed their business advisory structures. That kind of is all captured there. So that has been the top kind of policy focus of the last two years and has been in the top five pretty much um, consistently for the past 11 years since we've been doing this. So obviously employer engagement is a is a always going to be a top priority, uh, both opportunity and challenge, I say, for CTE. I think otherwise, uh, I mean, I think we'll talk about this. I think a lot of the same trends, right? We were all kind of keeping our eye open of what is the impact of AI? What is the impact of kind of the greening of the economy? Um, how, how do we continue to... My dog just really wants to be here. This is the third time he's busted it through this door. Um, and really, how do we make sure we're being responsive? I think there's, as CTE has really grown and involved um, in the past decade or, or plus in terms of that really is a priority in states, how do we really make sure we're doing that kind of cohesively with workforce, with economic development, with the STEM community, um, so that it's really about getting to a more cohesive, integrated system rather than multiple siloed system, which we've had in our country for, for decades. So I'll pause there. Happy to obviously go more in depth on any and all the things. Awesome. That's that's a great start. I know this has been, um, I was just listening to a podcast yesterday about industrial economic policy and how it's uh, certainly like was sort of push, pushed against and workforce development programs are but it's sort of been the signature of this last, this current administration has been um, really, you know, developing industrial policy to support things like semiconductors and um, renewable energy sources, et cetera. Um, and, you know, a lot of those are technician roles that are, are going to be emerging. So um, there's a lot of incentives placed out there for programs. So it's an interesting time. Um, I want to zoom down a little bit, Brian, and sort of move to where ASCDSD is um, in this space. Um, you know, you kind of work a little bit more at the at the granular level, granular level, but about, but also across the country with with educational leaders. Can you give a little bit of a nutshell of what you're seeing and um, for our audience a thumbnail? Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for having me, uh, Ted. And just a quick background. So you, you all see I am with uh, the chief growth officer with ASCD and ISTE. And if some of you don't know, uh, we have officially merged last year. Um, ASCD has always been really known for the research-based content and professional learning, really around pedagogy, teaching, and learning, where we've always focused on curriculum instruction and leadership, right? And now with the merger of ISTE, we have now become really a global nonprofit organization that's really dedicated to the not only the research-based content that I just mentioned with ASCD, but now the advanced use of technology and learning for teaching that ISTE has been um, focused on for years. So between the two organizations, you know, ASCD has been around for 80 years, ISTE for 50. We have a lot of uh, background within this whole area. And, and really on, on our side, we believe in, in the whole child. And what that means is there's not really one size fits all approach for education. So as we focus on the whole child, we really believe on the importance of career and technology education, CTE, connected learning and STEM. Um, and the reality is what we're seeing, because we work hand in hand with school districts, not only around the country, but around the world. So really what we're seeing on the ASD and ISTE side for the whole CT and STEM initiatives is as we go out and we work and do professional learning with educators uh, around the country, we're seeing where there's a lot of new teachers coming in. Right. Not only just in education, but specifically in the CTE field. And they're coming in as experts. Um, in their field, but what they're lacking and they're struggling with is the whole the pedagogy side. How do I teach? So that's one of the areas that we really focus, and we're seeing a, a a big improvement in an area where we can go in and work with school districts around the you know helping teachers in the whole pedagogy side uh, around the CTE field. Because um, especially when you're looking at the areas that ASCD and ISTE are known for, is we are known for the professional learning side resources, whether it's books, publications, webinars, um, the EL Magazine, education and leadership that comes with us, that we do actually sit and work down with a lot of our schools. Um, and as we merging it with the ISTE side, we look at the ISTE standards of education, where a majority of the states have adopted the ISTE standards. So as we emphasize and design this authentic learning experience, we're promoting digital citizenship collaborating with others that we could apply CTE and STEM education to educators around the country. 
Um, so when, when we think of everything that we are continuing to work on with, with school districts, one of the things that's important that we're actually doing with ISTE is um, really how we're working with the industry, indus industry partners. Um, I'm not sure if anybody has ever been to ISTE Live before, but ISTE Live has 20,000 people come to this conference and the exhibit hall is enormous and it's filled with amazing industry partners. So that's an area that we're really looking to grow, especially in the, the, this field where we've actually created what's called the ISTE seal, which is now being incorporated within school districts RFPs. So something that we all want, that we want to get more and heavily involved in the uh, the CTE and the STEM fields, because as educators can now look for ISTE uh, and the ISTE seal so that we have a validation product that we're working with companies and organizations to say, you know what, if you're bringing in uh, industry into our schools, we want to make sure that we are uh, ISTE aligned and, and have that ISTE seal so that we're all collaborating together. Uh, I, I could do a whole, we could do a whole webinar about ASCD and ISTE because there's so much, but I just wanted to give you that brief background on how we're working with schools, especially in the, um, the CTE uh, fields. Yeah, it's great. I think building that capacity uh, for, you know, effective instruction is really critical and also for effective partnerships, because it's not just, are you, you know, can providing context and instructional methodologies that are like engaging students, but also you want to make sure you're getting the right information to folks and you're having that, you know, bi-directional feedback loop that gets people, um, that really is like the magic of CTE, I guess, in a lot of respects is that CTE is really when, when done well, um, you do have, you know, like the, a steeper engagement, um, particularly on the employer side. So I think that's a good segue to, to you, Doug is like, um, and I know Doug is like squeezing us in, in the middle of a of a busy, crazy day. Um, but Doug, at, you know, at Valverde, um, can you just talk a little about some of the ways you're building these partnerships with industry? I mean, from wine to um, uh, uh, fire, um, you know, uh, folks in, in California, like Cal Fire, um, just how you're building these partnerships and what, what you're seeing on the ground. Sure. Hey, good um, not feeling for most of you, it's still morning for me. Um, yeah, so one of the big things that we've been trying to do throughout our entire programs is make a, a true K-12, like, uh, braiding of putting everything together, right? So and we, in high school, we call it a lot of CTE, and on the on the K-8 side, it's it's STEAM, it's STEM, it's it's getting kids problem, solving problems, it's doing all that kind of stuff. But the, when you want kids to solve problems and you want to keep a focus on the workforce and that kind of stuff, then you have to have continual conversations and continual partnerships with your local workforce. So for example, like Ted just mentioned, um, we're running a, uh, we're partnering with the national forest service and Cal fire today to run an event, to start recruiting kids into jobs. So when you look at seniors and you look at jobs in fire jobs in military, those kinds of things, those jobs have recruited themselves for years and years and years and suddenly now they have a they have a shortfall of of staff so short staff um, of applicants. They don't have people applying because they've they've never put together a recruiting program. So now it's like, oh, we need to start talking to kids. We need to start talking to high schoolers. We need to start that kind of stuff. So we've got uh, literally on the other side of this wall behind me, five hundred kids, and I've got ladder trucks and EMS and all kinds of stuff um, and kids exploring what careers look like because a career in, in the fire business doesn't mean putting out a fire and running a hose it could be a mechanic it could be marketing it's business it's it's you know uh communications is all those kinds of things so it's it's partnerships like that is partnering partnering with our community colleges with our civic partners so with a, when you when you meet with the city they connect you to every business and, the, and they know every single person they have the contact person from all that and being able to sit down and say hey listen i've got twenty thousand kids and they're your next employees what would you like them to know and then i backwards map because i was in the classroom for 19 years as a biology teacher i know how to backwards map you give me the assessment i will backwards map to make sure my kids understand that and that's what i do now with um but but i'm backwards mapping from the career workforce and the technical skills that industry partners have told me that this is what they're looking for this is what's going to help kids get a competitive advantage when they have an application that says this credential or this internship or something like that and once you put that all together, then I feel like that's giving my kids a a a head up the, over the 
the competition to be able to get some of these jobs. So yeah, it's a, it's a continual conversation with local um, industry and local partners, but making sure that, that, that our kids know exactly what, what's happening out there and, and we give them the best roadmap on how to make it there. That's great. Yeah. I mean, I, and, and also at the, at the local level, you know, it's, it's, we often hear about like big companies and things like that, that are a big employer, say, you know, Cal Fire is a big employer, but also being able to build, um, you know, connections to where two thirds of most people work as small, medium sized businesses, I know has been an area of focus for you, Doug, right? Yeah, for sure, because there's a lot of local businesses that we have around here that are always looking for qualified people. And so we have advisory panels with both the college and our advisory panel. Where we invite small manufacturers. We have a couple around here that um, produce some really crazy things, everything from pieces to firearms to needles for hospitals. And, and but it's all it's all CNC uh, machined out. Right. So that's why our high, every single one of our middle and high schools are running CNC machines. So that these kids understand the difference between how a CNC machine works versus additive manufacturing and a 3d printer and that kind of stuff. So, um, and then understanding how to create the, the files that are then going to create something. So get them into solid works, get them into Autodesk, even in, even in kinder, we have them in Tinkercad, right? Cause we, we started in CAD design when they're six years old in our district, but that's, that's the understanding that like, that's the skill that's needed in the industry. So how do I backwards map that all the way through? And a lot of these local, we have, a few local manufacturings and they're just mom and pop shops, but they've got literally 25 CNC machines lined up and they're just, they're cranking stuff out. We've got some electric car, a electric car manufacturer in our, in our district. We've got welders, we've got all kinds of stuff. That's all lots of, lots of manufacturing jobs and, and getting kids to understand that like when you go to work at a manufacturing job, yes, we need the engineer that has an advanced degree, but we also need people to run the machine that have a certificate. So there's a, there's still a whole gamut of jobs that are available even within that one company. Yeah. Great. I, um, I guess, so like this segues into sort of my first question for the whole panel is one of these areas that, um, is continually spoken about as a challenge, even, even like in, you know, sort of STEM, like, you know, engineering, you know, these very like extensive disciplines, um, biotech, but is awareness. And how do we raise awareness among students, particularly students, first generation college students, um, you know, but but I, I would say, you know, economically disadvantaged students, but I would just say overall, like, you know, I, I can speak personally, like I, I had parents who were very educated. I had no clue about careers. Um, how do you what how are you raising awareness about careers in among stakeholders, um, particularly in some of the areas that career technical education is really tr um, trying to um, meet, meet uh, address workforce needs? You know what, Ted, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in first here, because I think this is um, I feel that we all need to really do our part in creating this overall awareness. I think we need to get what Doug in his school and his district is doing. We need to get their voices out there so that everybody fully understands really what CTE means um, and actually giving that opportunity for our students in, in any areas. Because, you know, the, the labor market, the data, it's, it's clear, you know, that everybody does not have to attend a four-year college to get a good paying job. Doug just mentioned that right now, that yes, you need that engineer to go in there, but we need people to come in and work in these areas. And, and the reality is, is there's not a one size fits all approach in education. So, you know, on ASCD and ISTE, we have multiple platforms that we could address this awareness. And I mentioned uh, other areas like EL Magazine, ISTE Live. We also have Ed, Ed Surge, which is an editorial independent project that we have that can go out and start to get the word out. But I think it's up to all of us to start spreading the word, putting Doug in his school and other schools uh, out on a pedestal so that people understand that they have this option. And, and Ted, you mentioned this as well, is that, you know, we have a lot of educated people out there who don't really fully understand what the, what the opportunities are out there. And the more there's a lot of schools out there that like Doug that is doing some great work. We just need to get that message out there to everybody. I mean, I'll to build on um something that Doug said. I mean, I think a key part of this is starting earlier. I mean, we have to engage students at middle grades and ideally element elementary. 
um, there's this, I don't know, there's kind of this research concept called occupational identity. And essentially at like the teenage, like at 13, 14, 15, middle grade age, students kind of lock in or learners lock in who they, what they actually can do. Like they, they start to identify like what occupations actually am I going to be, are going to be accessible and for me to do. And it is based on what they've been exposed to. And so if you are 14 years old and all you're exposed to is what you see on TV and what your neighbors or your family does, well, for some people that grow up, some students that grow up in world of privilege, they might have a broad view. For the, those that grow up with less privilege, they're going to have a much smaller world view, which means they might not see themselves in, in what they're not aware of. And we know there are so many jobs that, that people are not aware of, as you're saying this earlier. So getting that exposure through industry partners, through schools, really expanding career advising. Um, and and I think there's some tension because a lot of people say, well, we shouldn't like be tracking kids and they shouldn't be learning about careers and that just is turning the widgets. That is absolutely not the case, right? I mean, when you want to think about making learning authentic, you're embedding career and like problem solving into that. And you can actually just have that intentionality of how are you making connections of what you're learning, what you're exposed to and what those career opportunities are and start doing that at very early ages, right? Kids can start to actually build out those worldviews. But if you wait until they get to high school, like you're gonna get the kids that already knew about it, that already have their, their siblings, their family, you know, unless you're in a really robust, you know, community that that is kind of aware of this. So I think that has to be really intentional. And yes, it cannot just come from the CTE community. It has to come from counselors, from the academic teachers, um, certainly from industry, from your community partners, right? Who else is kind of on message, right? And I think what's really important, I'll say this is you should not be engaging students in high school, in elementary, middle school about what CTE pathways are available in your feeder high school. It should be actually looking at the full world of work, exposing of what is accessible in your community, but also more broadly, to not shut any doors, right? And actually allow them that opportunity to really understand um, the diversity of opportunities out there. All right, so <clears throat> here's another interesting thing is um, when it comes to elementary in a world where an elementary teacher has got to teach them how to read and has to teach them how to do math and then, oh, we're supposed to do science. Don't forget the computer science. Don't forget the art standards. Don't forget. It, um, if I start having conversations about career and it's now considered one more thing, then uh, I could tell you exactly how that's going to go for me. It's not going to be good. So um, this is my strategy and, you know, it's different than other people's strategy, but I hide it. And when I hide it, it looks like this. So if I know that in a CNC machine or a 3D printer or any manufacturing type equipment, if we understand that it's basically input output, if you didn't get the, the, the what came out of that machine was not what you wanted. The machine didn't change its mind. Your input was wrong. So understanding that you got to put the correct input in to get the correct output, right? So whether that's your CAD file or whatever you're doing, well, I can do that exact same thing with a um, Lego robotics. So a kid can be block coding, looks like Scratch Junior, and they're block coding in a robot, and they wanted the robot to turn left and it turned right. Hey, guess what? Your input was wrong because what the robot did was opposite. Well, now I take those Lego robotics, and it's just an example. We have other options. But now we're teaching the, the skills to be able to run giant machines in the community, and we're losing a piece of Lego equipment that – um, has the same basic concept of input output. It's just scaled down to being in, in second grade versus high school. And so if you if you build lessons and build in, in engineering activities, and I do have STEAM teachers at each school, and those STEAM teachers do nothing but creativity-based lessons where these kids are problem solving. They can be art um, arts integrated. They're pushed into content areas. They're engineering. They're building things. They're doing all that kind of stuff. But we're starting them in kinder. So if you start exposing kids to that, that problem solving mentality at an early age, because the 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 data that I saw and the research I said uh, saw said that by third grade kids are making up their mind whether they're a science kid or a math kid or that's not for me. I don't like computer science. I don't like those those. So if you're waiting till middle school, you're too late. Like you got to be expose them to those types of um, classroom activities that um, have the the underlying skills of what we need in the workforce and CTE, but it feels like elementary, like it's it's Legos, it's Spheros, it's Ozobots, it's it's doing pictures, it's Tinkercad, like it's, it's a 3D printing. So so even the the people who are not into computer science can run a, a program and 3D print jewelry, right? So because they want to do design work, they're a designer. Okay, that's fine. We got we got something for everybody. So just being able to get them to understand those things at an early age 
going to make things a whole lot easier in high school when we're trying to say, hey, you guys should start thinking about, well, we start the conversation in middle school, but in high school, you're focusing on, hey, a career, like what you got to make money in this world. So what 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 are you wanting to do? What would you like to do? Because we're going to get you some options on, and that are attainable for you. Um, we just need to know what it is you like. So, um, so yeah, I hide it. That's what I do. Awesome. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's putting it into context, I guess, right? Like, Can, can I add one more thing, though? Because I, yeah. I think these are all great. But I think there's also about how we talk about these pathways and we would talk about careers. And, you know, I mean, Brian, I think you were like intentional, like not everyone needs a four-year degree. What often you hear is not everyone's going to go to college. So do CTE. That's, that's a non-starter, right? That like immediately disengages a lot of families, frankly, like most CT students do go on to some post-secondary, whether it's a two-year certificate apprenticeship and kind of understanding the diversity. But I think that's kind of one. It's like, how are we framing it? So it's not an other, it's not like this lesser path, which it has been seen, right? And still seen by many, right? When those that, you know, Ted, you said like, you never thought about this. I never thought about when I was in high school. And now like, I what a regret I have that I didn't engage in this. But I think the other thing is we're talking about learners, I think that's important for kind of industry and education to think about is when you think about particularly like Gen Z and, and the younger kind of learners that are coming up, they're actually, they're looking, they absolutely want security, they want financial independence, but they also want purpose in what they're doing. And so how do you actually connect the work, the careers to improving their communities, improve solving, I think solving the big problems, right? Solving climate, solving um, inequality, right? Solving health crises. Like there is, I think, a real, it's a very different bent, I think, in kind of the younger generations and marrying the way we talk about, create the problems, talk about jobs, right? Have industry, like employers talk about the work that individuals are doing when they're applying while also recognizing we still, they still want financial security, right? Kind of in, in all these things. So I do think there is a messaging element to it that it can't just be from kind of the advocates and CTE, but everyone kind of speaking about this cohesively about what the benefits um, are and that it is equally valuable, right, to a more traditional four-year path. It's not a lesser than path. It's equally valid. Um, and, right, that it really will give that purpose, which is, again, people are not really looking to, younger people don't want to punch the clock, right? They want to do something that's meaningful with their time. Yeah, yeah can I jump on my... more on that. Yeah, I love to. I mean, I you're actually I... with the kids every day, so. I want to jump on my soapbox real quick. So, this is the the push that we've been making through our entire district. So a lot of times when you ask kids to choose um, college and career, which by the way is the phrase I hate the most because it makes it sound like college was the finish line. College is not a finish line. Career is the finish line. So why are they put in the same phrase? So then to be able to say, okay, what do you want to go to college or do you want to go to a career by asking a 14 year old in eighth grade? Well, I remember being 14 and I didn't make any good decisions. So why are we asking other 14 year olds to make a good decision? So this is what we've done in our district is every single CTE pathway is also A through G, in which A through G is our college requirements in California. And then we require everyone to get into pathways. So we're, it was a lot of selling with counselors on how we create a system like this. But I can tell you last year's graduating class, um, 84%, 86, 86% of my seniors that graduated across the district last year, all 1,100 of them took a CTE course. So 84%. And of those 84%, 46% of them finished a two-year pathway. So the idea is that, no, 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 what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to give that kid who knows how to run a machine. He knows how to engineer. He can run the software. He can do all those things. And at 18 years old, when you graduate from high school, because I can't help you past 18. Now you decide I've given you the credential. You're a solid works associate. You have that. You can go to college, get a four-year degree. Let's go be an engineer. You want to do a thing. Or if you just want to make money right now, you also have your certif uh, certified in being able to go around a CNC machine. You have experience. You can put on your resume and you'll get a job right now. So now we took it off of a 14 year old, you know, acne filled um, hormonal kid who can't make any good decisions. Now we put it on an 18 year old who theoretically are going to go be an adult at this point. So now they, that hopefully will be a better choice at that point. And they can always change their mind because we gave them both. So that's my soapbox and I'm off. Thanks. And thanks. Ted, I know you want to jump to the next question, but I think this is really important because Kate nailed it. We need to frame this differently. And I see stuff coming up through the chats right now that a lot of people agree. And what Doug's doing is important. And, and if, because we see a lot of students going to college because that's what they're supposed to do and then dropping out. 
because they are not doing what they want to do. They're doing what they thought they were supposed to do. So I think this needs to be framed exactly the way that Doug and Kate are saying is at that elementary, middle school. And again, like Doug said, we're not picking what we're doing, but we're learning about it and we're seeing where our strengths lie so that when we do get to that point where we can make a decision, what avenue we go, we have a better choice. We have better choices for ourselves. I think that's one of the most important things that we need to focus on. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we've done a lot of work in the over the years in in this space, and what I love Celeste Carter from National Science Foundation. She's an advanced technological education program, which really supports a lot of this career connected learning in the STEM space, and um, you know, particularly for technicians. And um, she's like, I hate the I hate the word pipeline. Pipeline drives me crazy because it's it pipeline implies that water doesn't go back to the pipeline, or once it leaves the pipeline, it doesn't go back in, and we need to think of the paradigm more as like, you know, you can do this role. I, we talked to one of our members today who's leading an apprenticeship program. This is going to pivot to this question. Um, and they were like, yeah, actually, we've had a lot of conversations about how can this be potentially a, a, a talent development pool, um, bringing in folks as technicians for our engineers that like if they come into these apprenticeship programs and they spend some time working these technician roles, they might be really good candidates to return to school that we're going to pay for and invest in and bring them back as engineers because they're going to know the ins and the outs of what the manufacturing process looks like in a way that somebody who just comes in after an engineering program wouldn't. So there is an argument to be made that like these pathways can actually lead you to be even more proficient in your your field um, and can can kind of be, as, as Kate said, interesting. And um, I think it's interesting, remunerative, and um, impactful are sort of the the different um, areas that we look at. Um, so I'm going to, I want to just kind of on what I was talking about with, it, with our employers, I, I've seen, uh, you know, our friends at Boeing and Lockheed Martin and um, some other folks chiming in in the chat. Um, I know UL is on as well. C can, you know, what is the role for employers? And, and also like, um, you know, how, that's what we look at at STEM Connector is how do we get employers in here? And I know Doug, you spoke about small, medium-sized businesses. I've heard some discussions on, mentoring, but can y'all talk about some ways that you, you can envision employers being impactful um, in your pers respective arenas? I go first. <clears throat> so I think the the biggest the biggest thing is 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 when we sit down and have conversations, um is I need to know the technical skills and what it is you're looking at for employment. So that's when, when we sit down, those are the conversations. So I get a lot of the, well, I need, just need them to show up and I'll teach them the rest. And I'm like, okay, well, that doesn't help me in the high school develop kids that are actually quality applicants. So then it takes a lot, a lot of conversations of fleshing out, like, no, exactly. What are you looking for? Well, okay, well, I'm looking for kids that can solve a problem or that can work together with, other people and, and collaborate and those kinds of things. Okay. Well then all right, we're going to start working on group projects. We're going to teach kids how to, you know, you know, our cat, we used on shape for our cat design. And then it's, it's like a Google drive for that one. They have four people working on the same project at the same time. So that's a lot of collaboration and, and group activities and group designs and those kinds of things. So it's a lot of those like um, um, conversations about, about that. And I think one of the, one of the things that I've get is some companies are, um, apprehensive to let uh, k-12 in the door because they they can't hire us right so a lot of them they're not hiring an 18 year old they want want more people so they um and i'm not saying everybody um but it's a conversation of like no like we're going to help you but even though you won't see them for four years some of them have to go to college some have to go to you know some trade school or some certificate work and they got two-year degree or something like that we can help you with lay all that down and the other thing is well, i'm not looking for money like that's another thing companies come in they're like oh i don't i don't have money and i'm like i don't have to ask for money i got plenty of money and cte money there's plenty of that in the country i just need to know what you want like because otherwise we're just blindly shooting ducks in the dark i guess you could say not even in a barrel in the dark because we don't know what you want we're guessing what you want and it would be much better if we were very very targeted and giving you exactly what you want i want to be clear that not everyone has as much ct money as someone in california on it <laughs> that, that's true in california that is not true everywhere it's true some places but not everywhere you guys have been very blessed by a lot of investments i think that's right i mean i think this you know i was thinking about this question you kind of put to us ahead of time ted because at the national level in the state level it's so hard because it, as i said earlier it is like one of the biggest challenges of how do we you know systemically engage employers keep them at the table recognize that like we have to translate the education and, and employer like language that I had recently had someone, an employer come and be like, can you 
have the district stop like asking us to do like things during the school day because we all have to work. Like we can't give up a, like a work day and a school day. And I'm like, well, you guys need to have that conversation together. of Like what is the best time to come together and, and be like honest about what you have, what you need. But I do think there is, sorry. Um, I do think one strategy that's really okay. been successful is the use of intermediaries and really looking at if you don't have one in your community, are there chambers, are there economic development agencies, are there third party or you know, third um, party advocacy organizations that, can you all hear my dog? I really apologize. Um, that can actually be that bridge and can take some of the administrative burden off of both the district and the employer to like help make those connections. And I think that's what we've seen. There's some really successful ones to really facilitate, particularly as I think, you know, Doug mentioned a number of things that are needed. But also we're talking about trying to move down to middle school and elementary school. That's even a harder sell for employers because they're so much further away from that time pipeline. Sorry to use that word. So having kind of a better understanding of where, like what the light touches, what the medium touch, what the high touches through the continuum of elementary, middle, high school, whether it is just kind of that one, you know, coming to the advisory versus actually doing the work-based learning experience, which we know is a big priority in many states and communities. So I do think like the capacity within this system is not really there. Um, it's really like doubling down on one more thing, right, Doug, to use your word, often on teachers, on counselors. So where's that capacity, whether through intermediaries um, as individuals or organizations? I think that's mean that when you see scale, there's usually an intermediary involved. That's awesome. Yeah, and I'll just jump in real quick because there's not much more to add to this, but really what we look at it uh, on our side is with ISTE, we do look to have partnerships with industry. And I think that's one of the biggest areas that we want to grow in because we know that CTE programs, that once we start to work with industry, we can help with the professional learning side of it. Um, uh, adding work-based education, a uh, mentorship is huge as well. Cause as Doug was mentioning earlier, you know, a lot of people don't know how to get involved. Mentorships, uh, internships at that level, uh, field trips coming in is very important as well. And, and going back to the professional learning, we want to make sure that as people are coming into the education space, that they are ready and prepared. Um, I I got I was lucky enough a couple of years back. I went to a small rural district in Texas. It's called Roscoe. Um, Roscoe ISD, and it's it, they actually are now known as the Roscoe Collegiate System. They are a true P20 school, and I highly recommend if anybody has an opportunity to look them up because they've done a really good job at creating this system from the elementary school up through graduation to certifications to kids going right into the workforce. And they've done that by partnering with local universities, um, state universities, and companies as companies uh, that could be... Um, involved with drones that could be involved with any of the uh, agriculture in, in their area as well. So there's a lot of people out there and a lot of schools who've done some tremendous work that I think that we need to start to put on the platform, what Doug is doing, what Roscoe Collegiate is doing, so that people can actually see what's happening and how it works. Um, some tremendous opportunities for us to learn from one another. Yeah, another one of our partners in the STEM Connector Network that I want to give a shout out to, I don't see him on here, is Stan Elliott at, um, I don't know, Martha McCabe, who's in, out there, knows him in Lee's Summit uh, with University of Central Missouri, where they've created a um, program to engage students in, you know, in, in, in high school um, in work-based learning and getting students, you know, um, I think also one piece too is um, a lot of communities in this country are, are facing a loss of their students. And so... Um, we don't think of just retaining people at an employer. We think of retaining people in our communities because those folks really do create community. Um, and so how do we show people that they can make a good living here? They can do interesting work here. They can do meaningful work here. Um, and, and, you know, I think meeting the, you know, the more that you can engage students in that space is really critical. Um, you know, I, I like this question here. Um, you know, I see one um, in the chat box that's, you know, and I think sort of all that sort of is a culmination of a lot of different points that are being made. But how do we brought is there an opportunity to broaden, um, you know, CTE to more students? I know that maybe the, the funding isn't there, but how do we have career connected learning? Perhaps maybe we don't. But, you know, is are there ways that y'all can envision more students getting access to this type of learning? I tell you what, I laugh because Doug said that they hide it, right? They, they hide it in, into what they do, but that's exactly the way to do it. And not necessarily hiding, but 
ingraining it within the curriculum that students at the elementary level on up go so that they're actually doing it in ELA, in social studies or whatever area that they're in so that it's incorporated. And, and I know that's hard to do, but when you have schools like Roscoe or, or schools with Doug and that he's working is, it's incorporating it and blending it into that curriculum because it just becomes a part of the everyday mold and, and they don't even think about it. And I'm sure, Doug, you can you can expand upon that a little bit yourself because you're doing it. So I think one of the <clears throat> first things that I did, so I've been doing this job for eight years. So I was like I said, I was a biology teacher for 19 years. And I moved to this job. One of the first things I realized was that we had 20, there were 22 career pathways across the district and they were in certain topic areas. But I, I was like, but this isn't exactly like if reflective of student interest. So we started growing. So we added uh, more engineering. We added supply automation. We added uh, manufacturing. But the biggest growth that we've done is because in California, there's a huge creative workforce. And that creative workforce is not necessarily tracked accurately in workforce data reports because there's a lot of people that do side jobs and and do all that kind of stuff. I mean, if you want to get that that pure um, entrepreneurship type of mentality, you want kids who can actually run their own business. So, so we added more. So now every single school does video production. They run their own video channels. They do their own daily news. Kids are cutting videos. They're getting certified on a Adobe Premiere Pro. We have photography classes, graphic design classes. We've now added social media classes. So now kids are learning how to, like the basic tenets of how to put together entire social media. And that could be making your own music. That could be cutting your own, making your own graphic design. How do you, how do you do those types of things? We added... Uh, one of our CTE pathways is uh, folklorico. So we have a huge Hispanic population. So we decided to make that a CTE pathway. But the way we do that is the kids are just doing all the work. So this is what happens in the real world. If you want to run a dance studio and all that kind of stuff, you got to know how to put all this together. So the kids are, de are designing dances and choreographing and doing all the work um, on our folklorico, uh, as well as all of our uh, other dance programs. Um, so it was a matter of we have theater, we have all those are all CTE because we got it, you really there's theaters out there. So it was a matter of making it like there's CTE standards that go with all those things. But now you have kids that have that were you don't think of as your normal, you know, theater kid. You may not think of as a normal CTE kid, but now that is a CTE kid because now they're having to run all the technology in the theater, and we've spent millions of dollars upgrading our theater. So this is this technology in our theaters is just as good as any theater you're going to find out there. They've got to learn how to run all that stuff. They got to learn how to build sets and construct sets and decorate sets, and so it's a, it's all skills, but it's finding something for every kid. So now I could say that we now went from 22 pathways eight years ago. We have 52 pathways. So, and it was a matter of, of what are the kids asking for? Now let's create a program that would help them be able to get a job in that if they want to. Now if they just want to have fun and be a theater kid and that's not their job, fine, you can do that too. But at least now they have something that gets them engaged in school, gets them coming to school every day. They're plugged in. And I think that's the kind of the, the growth that we've seen on the, on the CTE world. We don't, we don't hide it in the CTE world. It is out front in front of you. We just want everyone to get to your pathway and let's get it. So. I mean, I think, I mean, we would certainly advocate that every student should be a CT student, every single benefit, right? Even if you don't pursue that path, like learn that earlier, right? Gain some skills and make, make a decision of, I don't want to do this thing when you're 17. Like that's a win, right? To like exclude things. I think some of the biggest barriers, right, are adults and perceptions we've already talked about. Um, having a school leader and a district leader that says, this is the thing we are going to focus on is a non-negotiable, right? Like you can have the best state policy, but until you have those local leaders saying, this is our priority, this is our focus, this is the goal, it's going to be really hard. Two is looking at your graduation requirements is another really big one and accountability, right? What are, what are the incentives? What are the incentives around AP is weighted more, right? For graduation, for GPA, for accountability over CT, you should look at that, right? Is that actually relevant given that a lot of CT courses, particularly in states like California, have dual credit kind of it's embedded within them. And so where are the incentives, where are the weights, where is the space like in your actual day? Are you allowing CT courses to count for academic? free up some space within kind of your four years of high school. I think that's a big barrier. Just we don't have time to take these courses. They're the electives. We need to get through everything else, particularly through this four-year mentality of we need to take the all the kind of AP, more advanced academics, which I'm not knocking them. They're incredibly valuable, but don't default into them because that's what you assume. That's the one way to success. 
And so I think those are some of the ways we'd have to get out at some of them are structurally and some of them are, are really just the people, right. And the mindsets that there actually is value in this for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think creating those, um, building awareness, uh, you know, I think really across education continues to be a challenge. You know, there's been, um, a lot of, a lot of, um, research, you know, that's the, this book, uh, that just came out, um, at the beginning of the year, end of last year, sort of focused on how we're kind of doing it wrong in this kind of wasted education, I think it's called. And, um, but it, it's been used as sort of an incendiary, uh, barb against STEM and, and, and career focused learning because so many people leave jobs, uh, that they, after their field of study, but, um, you know, I think that there, there, there are a lot of challenges that we face when we get students into a field. Um, we want to make sure that we're keeping them in the field. And, and sometimes the employers have a little bit of work to do in terms of creating the incentives to keep people in that, in that side of the field. If you go to become an engineer, but you can make more money um, managing engineers, well, guess what? You're probably going to go manage engineers, even if you're the best engineer. Um, so we kind of wind up with um, this um, workforce where we've done all this work to develop STEM professionals or techni STEM technicians or whatever you want to call. Um, and then we end up losing folks because we've created the, you know, the employer side. It's not the educator's fault. <laughs> so we can't, can't you know, unfortunately, um, we the education side gets blamed for for quite a lot of uh, of, of faults. Um, I want to, I've got a couple more, just we've got a few more minutes. Um, uh, right. So I'm just looking here. Um, Jenny, thank you for that. Um, on F35, um, you know, I, I think that's right. Yeah. Is that, is that, you know, you can continue on. So sort of reinforcing that point that you're not. Um, and also it can be way more affordable. I think that's uh, Glade Montgomery from Project Lead the way makes that point that, you know, once an employer gets you and realizes that like gets a, an employee that's like, they know has, has all those things that they want, you know, they show up on time, they work well with others, they continue to learn. Um, they like their job. They're good with customers. These, they, they, they're going to like invest in an employee um, rather than let them walk away. And so that might mean you're going to get your university um, paid for, you know, you're at least, at least at a bare minimum, like your tuition covered. Um, and maybe you're having to go to school while you're working or something like that, but um, it's not the end of the world. So um, I think that's a, that's a really great piece um, to consider. Um, just looking at through these, let's see, I know Brian, there was one for you, but it looks like you maybe answered it. Um, or somebody did. Um, well, I have a couple more. I'll, I'll keep looking here. Um, but I do have a question. Yeah, I know this is sort of, um, you know, one that's been brought up in the conversation. What about like parents, you know, how do we really help educate parents? Have you, you know, Kate, you sort of see things and Brian, you're looking at more of a macro, um, interested for y'all to sort of talk about like things, your, some examples of ways that you're seeing parents get engaged. No, no. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I'll like, uh, okay. Go ahead, Kate. That's fine. No, you're actually doing it. So I would love to hear from you. Well, I, I was going to say specifically when you look at a low socioeconomic um, population um, that I have, there's not a lot of, um, um, let's just say that counselors and schools were really good at selling that college was the only path for a few years and now it's a lot of like oh then then, then yeah we have my kid has to go to college i know i saw it in the comments over there um that that's the only path because we got really good at selling that and now we're trying to undo that and say no 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 like college is not the only path that is not the only path for kids to get a, a well-paid career and or to even make a a living and take care of a family there's other options and so then with families that the part that, that we work on is getting into their hands in sixth grade and having meetings and career activities and career exploration activities. And I'm currently working on designing um, uh, materials that will go into the hands of the parents so they can start seeing that there's, there's that's a multi-pronged approach to a career. It does not have to be a four-year degree, but there's a lot that have kind of, you know, they heard that for so many, there may be an older sibling or something like that that went through. I've heard it for so long that we got to kind of undo that work that we did for, I don't know, 15 years of saying college was the only thing. 
you know what, Doug? It's not just the last fifteen years. You know, I, I'm I'm older here, and, and I understand that it's it's the last fifty years, right? Um, and, and the awareness piece, I think, is very important at the local level. Um, and I think the schools need to do a better job of uh, educating parents at that early level. Uh, and Doug Doug mentioned that as well. But when I look at the the bigger picture of things, and, and I think I noticed this in one of the chats, is that we need to get um, CTE and STEM ingrained in everything that we're doing. You know how, how I see this is, remember when everybody wanted to go one-to-one, -one, right, with technology. Everyone wanted to put one-to-one -one in their buildings. So all the, the technology directors went out, they bought the Chromebooks, and they put them in their schools. The schools who did it the best were the schools who had the tech directors and the curriculum directors worked collaboratively together to do it. The ones that failed the most were the ones who just let the tech directors out and then they just threw one to one and then everybody used it as, you know, just just a, a typewriter, whatever. But I see the same thing in this area where we are today. We need your tech directors, your CTE directors and your curriculum directors all working collaboratively together. And, and I'm, I'm saying Doug a lot because I think he's doing some of that because when we're talking about project-based learning for elementary students who are doing a project-based learning around um, uh, an English project, it should incorporate CTE and STEM components. Same with math. So this needs to be a done at the local level, but it does have to have, a, there needs to be a bigger story around this where we need that collaboration within the districts so that the districts are working collaboratively together. And I know that's hard to do, um, but I think it's extremely important. And I so agree. And I think like importantly, it has to be two way, right? I think for years and years, it was figure out how to integrate. And then it was, let's integrate English and literacy and math into CTE. And that was the push is CTE needs to be reinforcing academics, which they do. The push never was how do the core academic teachers make sure they have authentic problem-based like industry-driven examples and practices. And that was never the push. And it still isn't really the push today. And I think it has to be two way to get to that end point where it really is. And I mean, how many, how many districts, how many states where STEM is, you know, and CT is not under academics, right? It's over here. STEM right. is over here. Like how they're even organized is is important, just like how schools are organized. And so I think those are some questions of what are some of the mechanisms at the state and local levels for these individuals to come together and do exactly what Brian is talking about. Yeah, and I, I saw Nancy McIntyre's question um, is sort of similar to the parents. It's like, how we ensure our guidance counselors are getting those things? And I know we're a little bit at time, but um, any any quick things on 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 you know you know how we're getting guidance counselors to be aligned with this rapidly changing dynamic that's happening in the workforce? So I would say that was a long process. That was a multi-year process to get all counselors to understand the benefits of CTE and to understand because they they those are their babies, right? Those are the ones they want to take care of. So they they don't want to do things just to do things. So it was it was a I was a salesman for years trying to sell them on, on this. And now the counselors are in front of it, leading the entire thing. The administrators are out leading it. And now they're telling the kids, no, you got to do a CTE pathway. This is what you need to do because this is going to help you for the, for your career later down the road. So it would say it's a, it's a long sales pitch. It's not quick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, my, my mother was a college counselor and I know like it's, you know, the paradigms are hard to shift to, you know, when people develop those in those roles, they start working with students and it's hard to kind of, um, go so yeah so i just dropped some resources in that we created and then delivered over 30 states and two different cohorts of counselors to actually get them like the basics of ct 101 um that now it's a fully modular take it use it um but i think there's a lot i mean i think there's do they have the time to do it do they actually believe in it or two different things we need to tackle and think about what other adults, counseling professionals in school, out of school, and how we're like taking a more holistic approach. So it's not all put on that guidance counselor, but are there career advisors? Are there work-based learning coordinators? Are there dual enrollment coordinators? Are there after-school providers, right, that are engaged that can also have this information to reinforce? And how are they all brought together, right, to be to be collectively supporting students across academic, technical, and kind of social emotional, I think is really important. Awesome. Well, we are out of time, so I want to be respectful of everybody um, joining this, but um, very much uh, appreciate our super engaged audience um, and um, this panel that was fantastic. And 
looking forward to more and more of these conversations this year with some of the stakeholders who are actually have attended this webinar uh, or participated. I like to say they didn't just attend. So thanks so much. Um, we'll send out a follow-up um, panelists. Remember, if you have any links you want to share with us, like, Kate, hey, we'll put that one in there. Please let us know um, very much. Thank you so much for um, such a great job. Like look forward to more of these conversations soon. Thanks everybody. Take care.